Today is a great and wonderful day, a day in which we celebrate all the saints, known and unknown, those who have come before, are here now, and who will come after us. This is a feast day of the church, and not just that, but a feast day for all of us. It is our day since all baptized Christians and those about to be baptized are counted among the communion of saints. Now I say all of us because we are counted among the saints, believe it or not, but I know we all probably have this vision of what saints are to be or are to look like, and it's not us. Well, it may be you, but probably not me. I read a meditation on saints one time that said, saints are people, not just some collection of stained glass perfect people, just people, plain old folk like you and me. Stained glass perfect people. I think we all know what that means. If you look at our windows, I know the rain doesn't help illuminate them, but if you look at them, we don't have too many of those saints pictured. We have a lot of Jesus and some of Mary in there. But if you look closely enough, we do have some saints. We have Gabriel up here and St. Joseph and John the Baptist and other apostles. Here we have St. Simeon and Anna in the presentation window. So we do have a few. But I think we could all agree that they are saints. But us, we're not like them except we are. We're people, just like they were people, with flaws and problems and baggage. They were people, people who just happened to spend some of the days of their lives with Jesus. But think about it. Can't you picture yourself or your friends in these windows? But in a sense, we are in these windows because they were made in memory of those saints who have gone on before us. Their names are written on the windows or on a plaque or something like that. And when we see them, we might think of these people. We might see them there. But believe me, God created you, and that makes you perfect enough to be depicted in any window, because you are counted among the saints. We are all called as God's children, called to be something great in this life, called to something great by Christ, called to be a part of his body. Our collect tells us that this morning, that we are knit together in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of Christ. And then it says something even better. May we follow the example of all the saints so that we may come to those ineffable joys prepared for those who love you. Now let me ask you a question. How many of you got stuck on the word ineffable? Uh Aha, good. See, someone will admit it. Maybe you're still thinking of that word ineffable. And who knows what that word can mean? Well, this this is what makes it so good. It means something too great or too extreme to be expressed or described in words. That's how wonderful it is to love Jesus. Because Jesus has prepared something so wonderful for us as to be beyond human description. It's exciting knowing that something that joyful awaits us. Not that we're in a hurry to get there, but just knowing that is reassuring. Our readings today give us that assurance of something great to come. The first two may sound familiar because we use them in our burial office. They are two of the choices of readings we have whenever we have a funeral or memorial service because they speak of the joy that is to come in the resurrection. And the gospel tells of resurrection itself. In Isaiah this morning, he writes, On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, a feast foreshadowing the messianic banquet 
where we will feast one day in heaven, a feast of rich food and wine, much like we do every week when we come to the table for communion. And the Lord will destroy the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations, and swallow up death forever. Destroy the shroud, take it away, take away the mourning, but also take away the ignorance. Open us up in order to see and to understand. And God will wipe away all tears, so there is no sorrow, only joy. And in John's revelation, he writes very similar words. He sees a new heaven and a new earth, and he uses this wedding imagery, symbolizing Christ and the church. And God will dwell among God's people, and God did as Jesus. And God will wipe away all tears. Jesus says, write this, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, our beginning and our end in Christ. And John, remember, tells us nothing new. He just reminds us of everything that is already there. And in the gospel today, we come into the middle of the story. If you remember back to the beginning of the story, Jesus is with his disciples, and someone comes and tells him that Lazarus is sick. But Jesus doesn't do anything. Jesus knows what will happen. Jesus doesn't go to be with Lazarus. And then Jesus tells the disciples, our friend is sleeping. And they, not understanding, say, well, if he's sleeping, he'll be fine, Jesus. And Jesus says, no, Lazarus has died. But he still waits. And eventually he goes and Martha comes to him and Martha says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus says, your brother will live again. And Martha says, I know that he will live in the resurrection. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? And Martha says, yes. And then we come into the story where we, where we heard it today. Then Mary comes to Jesus and again says, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus says, he will live again. And he asks where he is. And they take him and we're told that Jesus weeps. But Jesus doesn't weep because he's sad. Jesus knows what he is about to do. But he weeps out of a profound sense of indignation due to the people's hardness of heart. And Jesus calls on God so that they will know that this is God's doing and not just a magic trick that Jesus can do. And he calls Lazarus out and he says, unbind him and let him go. This is destroying the shroud, removing the sheet, removing the pall of mourning and ignorance so that he may see and understand and all those who were there may also see and understand. Jesus calls us to this greater understanding, calls us to be joined with all the saints to experience joy. In a few minutes, we will hear in the preface to the Eucharistic prayer that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. This is one way we try to describe the communion of saints. And I've thought about this my whole life, I really have, this cloud of witnesses. Of course, it takes on a new meaning in our current world. Are they talking about a cloud like one we see in the sky? Or the cloud, the eye cloud, or whatever we want to call it. You mean that enormously huge place where we store all our data and pictures and music so that we can access it at any time from anywhere? Well, yeah. You mean the saints are there too? Yes, they are, enjoying our data and music and everything else we've stored there. <laughs> it seems right, the collective memories of all the saints stored or gathered together in one place. And we are knit to it. We are part of it. And I think of fog, when we're in the fog, being in the clouds, surrounded by it, being surrounded by those saints, or walking into a sacred space and feeling the people who have been there before. And even when I feel alone, 
I know I can draw on that collective presence of the communion of saints. It is a joyful day, much to celebrate, much to anticipate as we feel the cloud of witnesses around us. And as we remember, we remember all who have come before us and all who will come after us. And as we gaze upon the saints in these windows, looking at a glimpse of what is to come, may we give thanks for the lives of all the saints. And may we continue to pattern our lives after them and strive for those ineffable joys which await us. Amen.